Okay, I think uh, so. Let, let's start. All right. Okay, so my name is Juan Cardoso. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Porto and uh, a member of the organization of these talks, a series of talks on uh, quantum computing. So, welcome you to this series. And uh, our goal of these talks uh, is to provide a forum of presentations and discussions of state of the art achievements and challenges regarding quantum computing. So the talks will focus on computer science aspects and uh, quantum computing engineering and technologies. Um, we have in mind to cover a wide spectrum of topics regarding quantum computing from programming models and language to technologies and applications. And um, the speakers uh, are leading scientists and researchers from academia, research labs and industry. The series is based on cycles of talks, typically from four to six talks, and uh, we intend one or, two talk, one or two talks per month, and sometimes including also panel discussions. And the target audience is mostly on, based on students, members of academia, researchers, and members from industry. So it is a pleasure to announce the first cycle of talks, which consists of uh, six talks. The first talk today by Kun Bertels from QB and the University of Porto. On February 3rd, we will have a talk by Frederico Spedalieri from Information Science Institute, University of South California, USA. On February 10th, we'll have Frank Lehmann from Universitat Stuttgart, Germany. And on February 17th, we have Ryan LaRose, University of Michigan, USA. On March 3rd, we will have Benjamin Bixell from ETH Zurich, Switzerland. And the last talk of this cycle be from, will be given by Thomas Gaber from Institute for Informatic with Big Maximilians in the Universitat on March 2010. So it is a pleasure to introduce you this first cycle. And thank you very much for also for the speakers to having accepted the the, our invitation to, to give a talk in this series. Um, and uh, just a note that, uh, so we have streaming on YouTube and uh, the talks, most of the talks will be recorded. So thank you very much. I'm going to give the word to Pedro Diniz from my NASC ID, and that will, he will introduce the first talk by Kun Bertels. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, João. Well. Hello, everybody. As uh, Professor Cardozo mentioned, um, my name is Pedro Diniz from INESC ID here in Lisbon, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the first speaker uh, for this uh, first cycle of talks, uh, Professor Kuhn Bartos, uh, who is with the QB and uh, the University of Porto. Uh, um, Professor Bertels has been very active in the quantum computing field for the last nine years and uh, he's been leading a group which was the first to define a full stack uh, for any quantum computing device. And uh, he's currently focusing on the development of quantum accelerators and uses the public domain tools that his team has developed over the years to help organizations and companies to develop quantum solutions for their most challenging problems. So without any further ado, uh, Kuhn, please uh, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, yeah, if, if there are questions during the talk, you could, you're free to ask them, of course. Uh, you can also save them for, for the end. Um, so I'll be talking about, indeed, quantum accelerators, uh, which I see as a, as a next uh, a step in, in quantum computing, because the focus has been a little bit too much, in my personal view, on the quantum physics aspects. And um, you may remember maybe in 2018, John Preskill, he published a paper and he, and he, and he was saying, let's stop uh, working on the surface code, let's do the noisy intermediate scale quantum computing. Yeah? And that is actually going back almost like 20 years. So that is, that is important to understand. So my, my, my presentation, I will, I will give some basics in, in quantum, but it's never full fledged, but I will try to, to, to highlight what the different layers are that we need to work on. And that basically opens up a lot of possibilities for, for maybe 90% of the people that work on quantum computing. They should be looking more, let's say, in, in a different direction. 
So anyway, what uh, what we have is uh, we have uh, we, if we do classical computing, we use classical bits. Yeah, so that's a zero or a one. It's an exclusive or. So it's either a zero or a one. And in quantum, well, we, we may even do the same. Uh, we, we talk about qubits. So a quantum bit is now from, from this light on uh, named a qubit. Yeah. And uh, we also can have, let's say, the zero or the one state uh, in combination with each other. And then you might say, okay, what is, what, is, uh, what is the difference between the two? Well, the difference is that actually you can combine qubits in a, in a way, in an and way, such that you, whenever you apply a quantum operation on, on a qubit psi, eh, here you see the, 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 the name psi, has two, has two base states, the zero and the one, with two amplitudes, this alpha zero and alpha one. And the amplitudes are basically the key element in anything about quantum computing, because the, the probability at some point with which a, a particular qubit state will, will pop up as the solution for your algorithm yeah, is basically determined by, by the, the, the amplitude. Yeah? What is very important to understand is that, uh, and, and, and again, um, uh, I've, I've been listening uh, maybe multiple times really to Vazirani, Professor Vazirani from, from California, yeah, uh, on, on his uh, online course. And he explains in multiple cases, we don't really know why this parallel implicit execution uh, is being done at the quantum mechanical, in the quantum mechanical world. And it's still a big unknown, yeah? But, but nevertheless, if I have a qubit uh, psi here, consisting of these two, zero and one, then whatever quantum gate, I do it on the zero state and on the one state at the same time, yeah? And so I will, I will come back to uh, in, in a minute. So I told you that the amplitude is important to, to, to determine now what the, what the result will be of your, of your computation. Yeah, again, you have here the psi, psi qubit with two amplitudes. And here you see the big I, which, uh, which in principle, uh, we should not, it's not like we, you read out uh, uh, visually the, 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 the memory state, yeah? because you, you have to do all kinds of sophisticated measurements. Yeah? Because, but the, it, let's assume it's a measurement. And you, you want to look at this super combined uh, qubit, zero, one. And so that means that this alpha here, zero and alpha one, they represent in principle the probability. So it's an, uh, in, in the qubit world, it's called an amplitude. But once we start measuring it and try to understand what, the, what its value is, they become probabilities. And how do you, pro how do you compute the probability? Well, it's the amplitude. Yeah, the absolute value of the amplitude squared um, is, the, is the probability with which the zero state is the most likely solution or the one state in this, in this particular case. It's important to understand uh, because the, the, everything in quantum is, uh, is a repetition of the same algorithm multiple times. And each time at the end of the algorithm, you need to do a measurement. And then you, you end up with some kind of histogram. Yeah, I will show that uh, later, a kind of histogram of the of the solutions that you that you're obtaining, so that basically means whatever quantum computer is non-deterministic. Oh, yep. Oh. Maybe mute, mute, mute your computer if you want, because otherwise, it I think it's a question. Unless there is a question, then you have to maybe manifest it, manifest yourself a little bit. But otherwise, yeah, please mute your computer. Yeah, so uh, quantum computing is, is a form of non-deterministic computing. So we already know that we do pro approximate kind of computing. Well, quantum is, is in a way is a, is a similar thing. Uh, again, I will not go into, into the details, but how many base states can we have? Yeah, that basically, well, in, in the classical computer world, we're used to binary reasoning, yeah, in which zeros or one. Yeah, and so, so in the quantum world, we do something similar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, please mute your computer, please. Yeah. Uh, so you can have, let's say, the, the X basis state, the Z basis state, and the Y basis state. And, and here you see a circle, but it's, it's representing actually kind of a ball. It's called the block, the block sphere, yeah, in which you see the, you see the three dimensions uh, 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 represented. And it's only in the Y, in the Y dimension that you see that you have an imaginary number. And uh, so that means the amplitudes are always kind of complex numbers, but they, they, it's not always that they have an imaginary number. And that really depends on the kind of operations that you want to perform on, uh, on the qubit states. Yeah? And, that and this is still like very unknown. Yeah? Um, we are using now three basis states. 
but it could be any number of basis states. Yeah, but it's kind of a reduction to to homogenize the, the thinking about about all these things. Now, where is the the popularity of quantum coming from? Yeah, and I will give towards the end another kind of graph. Yeah, which puts things a little bit more in in a different perspective. But let's simply assume that we that we have two qubits. Yeah, so on the on the on this scale, we have the number of and, and this is the word that I added myself perfect qubits, I will, I will highlight that later on. Yeah, so if I have two qubits combined, that's two to the power two. So it's always two to the power, yeah, n, I will try to write it down here. Yeah, so two to the power two is four, two to the power three is eight, two to the power 10, yeah, and it keeps on growing, yeah, uh, until you reach, uh, that is, I don't even know how many, how many numbers that that is. Yeah, but it simply, it goes always like doubling the number of qubits uh, states that you can actually uh, uh, represent and use in a, in, a, in, a, in a computation. Let's assume that you have, let's say, 300 perfect qubits, right? Very important to realize. Yeah, then, then this is even a number I cannot even pronounce in, in normal English, yeah? Because it's e to the power 90. So this is an incredibly huge thing. So if ever we're confronted with, let's say, big data problems, which we, we know we have to deal with, yeah, these are incredibly huge data pro big data problems eh, in quantum that we that we're capable we should be capable of doing. Now, the what is important is, is in this gray box, yeah, we double the compute power of any quantum computational device we will build by adding one more qubit because two to the power one is two, two to the power two is four, two to the power three is eight, then 16, 32, 64, and this is how it keeps on growing yeah, incredibly fast. Yeah, this is important to 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 uh, to understand. Now, how does uh, how does the, the 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 quantum algorithm how is it going to be executed? Well, uh, let's assume that we have three qubits here. So two to the power three gives us eight kind of different states, uh, basis states, and uh, and so when we start any algorithm, they're all given the same amplitude. Yeah? These these vertical lines, yeah, whether they are positive or negative. Yeah, they represent these amplitudes, which is the strength basically of a qubit state, yeah, of, a, of a qubit state in, in the whole computation of your algorithm. And you see that, uh, that when, when you're executing your algorithm, maybe some of those, those, those amplitudes, they, come from the, they become uh, negative, and then they again in the next run, they, they become uh, uh, positive again, but they will maybe basically always grow in size or shrink in size. Yeah. And so, uh, so after after executing any kind of algorithm after n kind of runs, yeah, you will see that maybe one of those qubit states has the largest amplitude. In this particular case, these are amplitudes, yeah, and for which we will we can always defer, define the probability, yeah. Um, and so the probability is the absolute value squared. That is basically how you make the negative amplitudes also in a positive probability, yeah. And then if you do that multiple times, you know, the same algorithm on the same number of qubits, this is very important. It's never a single run that you do. Like in classical computing, you always get the, the right result. Yeah, if you execute it once, yeah, uh, you don't have to re repeat it maybe 10 times or 100 times. Yeah? So you have to run multiple times. And after each run executing yeah, the, the, the algorithm, you have to do this measurement. And then at the end of, of, of let's say uh, 10 or 100 or whatever number of, of runs that you do of your algorithm, you do the measurements and that gives you some kind of here, I call it maybe some kind of a norm, normal curve. Yeah, and then you know, um, this free meeting will end in 10 minutes. Okay, uh, I don't think that needs to be done. Okay, um, so, so this, is, this is how you will, you will end up at this particular basis state, this qubit state, yeah, has the highest probability and this is then, and how that will be will be represented or and, and discovered uh, after n runs of the algorithm. So it never it's never a single run in a single measurement. It's multiple runs and multiple measurements. That is that is very important uh, uh, to 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 perform. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, how did I start? I'm not going to go into the, the entire details, but that was when I was at a different university in the Netherlands. Yeah, and I did manage, I was played an important role to have Intel land there to finance the quantum research. Yeah, because I'm a computer engineer, so I know how to make a computer. And did I know how to make a quantum computer? Well, I, I still don't really know. Yeah, but I, I, I do have a, a, I base myself on whatever I did in on FPGA related kind of technology. 
Anyway, we worked uh, for Intel basically on CMI and superconducting qubits. Yeah, and we developed also in that context our own programming language and a simulator. And also we worked on a microarchitecture. So the same microarchitecture for controlling the CMI and the superconducting qubits. I will come back to those things uh, also, also here. What is one of the big problems that we still have, that we still have in quantum computing, is that, uh, that we are that uh, the physics people do not can tend, do not tend to agree on how to make this one perfect qubit. Yeah. Because the error rates that we have in the in the quantum world, yeah, well, in the classical world, let's say CMOS, yeah, so the semiconducting kind of transistors that we're using, yeah, this this 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 16. Yeah. In quantum computing, we're only at 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3. So there's an incredibly big difference between those two kinds of technologies. That does not mean that quantum has no future, but that we still have to uh, 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 solve a lot of problems, that the quantum physics people have to solve a lot of problems, and actually a lot of other people that are listening, hopefully, uh, to this talk will also start working on, on different kinds of, uh, of applications. Yeah. Uh, so that is, that is uh, I think, an important, uh, an important observation that we should not forget because this has not been solved, okay? Let's be very clear. There is no single quantum technology that has a much better performance than any of the, of the others, yeah? So, uh, and of course, it depends a lot on companies that are investing, like Intel, Alibaba in China, yeah? IBM in, in the US too, yeah? But IBM is most of superconducting, semi on semiconducting, and Alibaba also on superconducting, but these are like hypes, yeah, that that evolves, yeah. So that that, that is very very important to uh, to to understand. So so this is an observation that that I make, which is which is uh, which is important, yeah. As I said before, it's it's dominated by quantum physics, yeah, uh, and and it's still dominated a lot by this NISC philosophy, which was introduced by John Preskill uh, uh, like like uh, uh, almost like two years ago. Yeah, uh, but uh, uh, we have to go, I think personally, we have to go beyond beyond that thing because we don't really know what quantum, real, really good quantum applications are. Yeah, people, so there, there are quite some number of people that are working on it, but they, they look, mo they're maybe focused too much on either superconducting or semiconducting. Well, semiconducting, that's almost impossible because the, the number of qubits is very low. Superconducting seems to be growing quite well. But still, we have so many uh, technologies competing with each other. And that is what I, what I described there. Yeah? And, uh, and so that basically means that people that are, are looking at physical qubits, they have to understand how to take the decoherence into account. Because if a qubit is put in a state, it's in nanoseconds, it goes to the ground state. Nanoseconds yeah? in a superconducting. So, so this is this is this is impossible. Yeah, well, maybe they 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 manage to go to one second or something. Yeah, but it's 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 extremely fast that you lose the information, and also the way that you do quantum computations. Yeah, these are these are let's say the block sphere. These are rotations, uh, uh, gate rotations in this block sphere, or if you do two qubit gates. Yeah, there are always kind of errors because it's a very difficult, very sophisticated, uh, low-level kind of physics that you're manipulating, and so even a deviation in in the electromagnetic kind of pulses that you that you send can can make an error in the quantum computation. Yeah, so this this does not mean that there is no future for quantum computing, but we still have to do. Yeah, we have to really understand. Yeah, that it's more than just qubits that we need. Yeah, and actually, it's not qubits as such, but we need really good qubits, and that is also very. Yeah, the the, the table that I showed uh, earlier yeah, highlights that. Yeah, but we need we need actually much more, and that is basically the 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 the, the core of what we did in Delft, and that I want to continue working now in in Portugal. Yeah, and actually at the European and international level, you see here how all our full stack how it evolved. From, let's say the first pictures that we drew on the whiteboard to let's say what you see here now is is the the latest the latest vision of the full stack yeah and uh, and and i'm happy to say that uh, that portugal is very very motivated yeah because they will they want to be with, uh, working on testing of quantum software which is a challenge in itself yeah so so um, uh, maybe important to realize that the at the bottom of the full stack yeah, we, 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 and I mentioned that in the beginning, I want to be focusing much more on perfect qubits, not on physical qubits or, or, or realistic qubits, but we cannot, we cannot avoid, avoid that, of course. So if at some point the quantum technology improves substantially, we need to make the change. And I will explain how we, want, we can make the change. This is a little 
jump in the past to show that even a company like IBM, yeah, and that is like two years ago, they were not interested in, in full stack, yeah, and one year later, they, they already presented a, a stack which is very similar to the one that we that we developed in, in, in Delft, yeah, which is now this one that you see on, in a larger scale here, yeah. And IBM, I may I may mention it uh, again, but, but IBM is a very prominent, yeah, and, and very rational uh, player in, in the field. So what uh, what is the the goal of, of what I want to want to talk about, yeah, is of course, yeah, how do we go from well, no, I will not give that that story because that would be that would be boring, yeah. But we we now have this particular kind of full stack. I just want to highlight one thing, yeah, that is like a year and a half ago I submitted my fourth quantum flagship project. Yeah, not for none of these four, I actually received money. Yeah, that, but maybe I'm very bad, but uh, I, I, yeah, and maybe that is possible. But I went to, to Brussels uh, because I'm Belgian by nationality. So I went to Brussels and talked to the EU responsible for the quantum flagship. And he went even further and he said that the quantum physics, if they're honest, they would admit that they're not even capable of, ca of reaching the 10 to the minus two quality of the qubits. So you, you see there's there's a big discrepancy between what the quantum physics world is always pretending, yeah, and companies pretending to that, and what we really are capable of doing, yeah. So um, so again, I will not go into the details because I will explain the different layers uh, later on, yeah, in, in actually in the, in the next uh, uh, set of set of slides, but um, but this is basically what uh, what we what we need to need to work on, yeah. So we, we need to look at, at some applications, yeah, uh, and, and uh, we need to work on, on testing, yeah, and, and why not start working also on an operating system? And again, here we have our own simulator, yeah, that we developed uh, in Delft, but it's now uh, partly also in this QB, which is a company that I created, yeah, uh, that we can still use to actually execute any kind of a quantum quantum algorithm. Now, what is the big picture? Yeah, the full stack implementation, and I will go into more more into details uh, at some point because I will give also one example. Um, is basically this 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 is the layer in which we are now uh, working in. Yeah, and uh, we've been working a lot. Uh, basically, yeah, this is basically what we did in in Delft uh, for 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 Intel. Yeah, is super semiconducting, but I was also planning to look at other kinds of qubit technologies. But in the end, I said like, no, because I'm all, only repeating myself and that is not, that's not, as a scientist, it's not very interesting, yeah. Um, I just wanna, wanna highlight here the fact that IBM, which has a wide community worldwide of people using this KISS kit, which is the software and, and hardware platform that uh, IBM is putting on the market, yeah, uh, is very good because IBM, the, the KISS kit kind of compiler is capable of compiling for perfect qubits. And this is very important also, uh, as I will explain a, a bit later also in, 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 in the talk. So basically what, uh, what is already available based on, on the work that we did for the Intel collaboration, yeah, it was a, a requirement from Intel that everything we did was put in the public domain, yeah. And so that means that we have indeed the full stack, which is more a concept, yeah. Uh, the quantum genomics, I will talk about that later, but we made our compiler also for the programming language. Yeah, the microarchitecture, we, we had a version, yeah, but now we're, we're actually reworking that particular version. We worked on mapping and routing, yeah, because the, you have the nearest neighbor constraint uh, for qubits. If you have two qubits that need to, that, on which you need to combine a, 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 an operator on these two qubits, if they're far apart, yeah, that can never be done. So you really have to move them around so that they're nearest neighbor, they're neighbors to each other. And there you can do a two qubit uh, operation. Yeah, and we have our simulator, but I will, I will say something about that later on. Yeah, but of course, as I said, we need much more. Yeah, so, so these are just indications of things that we, and I will explain this uh, as, uh, as I go on in, in, the, in the presentation. So these are the things. Uh, not, not about machine learning, yeah, let, let be very clear, because that is not, not really my, my topic, yeah, but everything else uh, we, we really understand, or I try to understand with the, with the people that I still have, yeah, we try to understand what, uh, what that involves, yeah. Anyway, so the, the big picture uh, about quantum application development, yeah, is something that we are doing also, let's say, in genomics, because I will give an example in genomics, yeah, done by, by, uh, by, by a, a Delft PhD student that I still supervise, yeah, uh, uh, Aritra Sarkar, yeah, and maybe he's listening and maybe he's not listening. I don't know now exactly where, where he is because he's, uh, he's in India right now. 
Yeah. Um, anyway, the, the 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 goal is that uh, that we need to develop an algorithm which consists of of things that we don't really know. Yeah. And that's why an oracle it always makes a prediction about about reality. Yeah. If we don't really know how to make an implementation, well, we call it a, a quantum oracle. Yeah. Um, that needs to be translated at some point in a full quantum circuit. Yeah, and that we want to simulate yeah, in our case on our simulator, so that we get real results on on the computer, the quantum computations. Yeah. So what uh, what uh, what kind of applications uh, are uh, am I now personally working on? Yeah, and that is of course with uh, with Aritra and hopefully two or three other PhD students soon on genomics. Yeah, uh, we work on let's say the basic algorithms that we need in, in, in genomics, which is the basis of everything in medicine. Yeah, and so that will only become increasingly important, but for every single human being on earth, not only for Europeans and, and rich Americans. Yeah, so, and we also started working here in Portugal on quantum economics and, and, uh, and finance. Yeah, and, uh, and here, this is just a, a, a starting point. Yeah, so we, 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 we haven't gone very far yet, but we're doing the analysis. But uh, my, my question to, to everybody listening now is why should we not look at anything else? Because accelerators are being developed worldwide on all kinds of applications, yeah? So why not design airplanes? Why not do traffic management in, in large cities, yeah? Where we have like overflow and, 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 uh, uh, and, and traffic jams and, and et cetera, yeah? We can have, you can use it for encryption and decryption of information. And it's dot, 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 because you, you, can, you can make an endless kind of uh, list of things that you can do. So this is, uh, this is a clear thing. If anything you want to take away from, from today's uh, talk yeah, is maybe look at quantum applications. And, and again, a lot of the things that we did in, in the, for the Intel people is basically a public domain. Yeah? And in QB, we're making it into, into a good operational version that we can share with universities and, and research organizations. Yeah, and, and of course, then for specific kind of customers, we can do extensions and, 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 and improvements of that. Yeah, so this is important to, to understand. If we make an application, and if, if, uh, if everybody listening today, uh, you would start collaborating with other people, yeah, and you would be developing a, a, a quantum application, so a quantum algorithm, yeah, that will automatically lead to what, what we call now a quantum library. Yeah, if these things you can you can do it inside your university, inside your research group, company, or you can simply share it with the with the world. Yeah, that means maybe we need we need new quantum gates, which is something that we already discovered. Yeah, doing quantum genomics. Yeah, that is what uh, what what we are discovering. That we do many more, let's say, mathematical operations that are needed in in quantum quantum genomics, but actually in many other applications. Yeah, we also want to increase the number of qubits. Yeah, again, as we have, as we are assuming perfect qubits, we don't need let's say forty nine physical ones to make one 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 logical, uh, one 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 good uh, reliable qubit. Every qubit is going to be reliable because if we want to think about the quantum algorithms, you don't want to be involved in is this qubit still alive or how do I make this into a logical one? Yeah, and do all kinds of quantum error correction that you need to do. Yeah. We did that in the first four or five years, yeah. And maybe uh, one of my older PhD students, and I call her now a colleague. Yeah, she may be listening. Yeah, she, that was her PhD on, on on surface code kind of things. Yeah. So um, and why also not also quantum methods with classical logical structures? Because this is also very important to realize that whenever you're, you're you're developing an algorithm, you will have to repeat certain operations on multiple qubits multiple times and I will come back to that also later on so that 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 means that we we are combining classical logic with quantum logic so that is also what openql our language our programming language is capable of doing so it offers a while and a for loop yeah on a matrix of, of qubits so that you can do operations yeah and we're still developing these things so it's not like we already have the perfect tools this is not the claim that I want that I want to make a person that will that will be uh, organized also or invited here yeah is doing quantum software uh, testing yeah uh, and and this is one of the papers that they that they published and i i thought that this this figure was interesting enough i will not go into the details because uh, i already uh, see that they they go too much let's say in the in the quantum on the quantum errors yeah and and i think there's a lot of things that we can we make our lives a bit a bit simply simple because even then what we have to do is still extremely complicated. So, so that is 
the, all the red bars yeah, are things that, uh, that I don't think we should be looking at now at, uh, at this stage. Yeah? Uh, we have also, we developed, as I said, uh, our own compiler. So I'm, not, I'm going down in the layer, right? We, we started at, let's say, the application level and yeah, the library and then software testing, yeah, which is important for developing an algorithm. Yeah, uh, you end up with a language. Yeah, so so uh, we have a compiler language. Yeah, so so the, I will not go into the details. I will simply highlight here two terms. Yeah, sequasm and equasm, because like any classical computer, you you have hardware interacting with hardware. Yeah, which is using usually is done uh, through an assembler language. Yeah, a binary level yeah, or whatever representation you wanna you wanna use, and we we're gonna be doing the same thing. So we we're starting now. Whatever in quantum genomics we will do, and even in quantum economics and finance, we are here in the top left corner. So we, we assume, as I said before, perfect qubits in a virtual world. So that means we, we don't really care whether they're close to each other or far apart from each other. If they need to do a two qubit gate operation, in this case, it's possible. If we need to have, let's say, uh, if we if we want to put a constraint on circuit and the, the mapping and, and routing, yeah, that means there should be a routing of, of qubits. Yeah, that is that is even possible on our topology. Yeah, that we have in mind about. Yeah, but but that will always be be different. Uh, let's say if it's an ion trap, or a majorana, or a, or a or a, or a, or a, a semiconducting qubit. Yeah, in any case, the, where the quantum physics people are is in in the bottom right. Yeah, is is here. And this is a this is a multidimensional world because you have all these quantum technologies competing with each other. Yeah, and they, they always uh, reason in terms of real qubits. So 10 to the minus two minus three. Yeah, remember that and 10 to the minus 15 like in CMOS. Yeah, so and maybe, oops, oops. Yeah, maybe we will we will meet each other in a couple of years uh, in the middle of somewhere. Yeah, that is kind of yeah, where, where, where we go again to logical qubits. Yeah, and, and they, they are good enough uh, to, to allow us to make maybe a surface code kind of qubit. Yeah, that, that, is, that is possible, but that is very difficult to, to predict right now. Yeah, whenever, whenever we have, uh, whenever we, we have a, a quantum algorithm capable or that needs to be, the, needs to be tested. Yeah, well, uh, what I'm proposing here uh, today are basically uh, classical computers to actually run a quantum, a quantum algorithm. There is no specific need yeah, to have a quantum chip, a quantum device to execute quantum quantum algorithms. Yeah, so you can do that perfectly on any classical computer. However, there's a big however, and that's what I'm going to show here. You need to you you need to provide an explicit parallel version of your algorithm to any classical computer on which you want to run your 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 algorithm. So uh, one 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 path is, for instance, this one. Yeah. Yeah, this is one path, and then this one could be another one, and then you 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 can you can keep on counting, and this is maybe the last one. So you may have a large number yeah, because there may be dots in between. Yeah, there you have a large number of, of final states that that if you want to run it on a classical computer, that is what you need to have. Yeah, in terms of memory and compute power to execute that. So the parallelization is really a big challenge. Yeah, which uh, which I have uh, I, I named this uh, I named the, the the professor in Porto that is uh, working uh, with with uh, with me on that. Yeah, as on classical uh, parallelization algorithms on quantum on quantum circuits on quantum algorithms. So that is still ongoing. We don't have any results yet, yeah? but this is the basic idea on which we we agree as a, as a, as a starting point. Why is that important? Yeah, well, simply because uh, the the number of qubits. Yeah, I already mentioned. It's two to the power n, yeah, is the number of qubits that we need to have, and uh, and, uh, and and here you still have the psi qubit as as as, as I uh, ex explained before, yeah, with two amplitudes, and the amplitudes are always these complex numbers. So it's a real state and the imaginary state. The imaginary may disappear, yeah, but there are always kind of two real components in 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 any amplitude, yeah. So that's why you end up here with the base number four to the power n. Yeah, and this is a, again a number which is so big. Yeah, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Uh, so, but this is the kind of memory that you need to represent all of the amplitudes of 
of 50 fully fully entangled or fully fully superposition kind of qubit superposition is is two two, two, um, uh, two uh, su uh, a superposition of two qubits is two to the power two so there are four situations and two to the power of 50 yeah is is this this number of of uh, of numbers that you need to represent yeah and if they're they're real numbers you know how many bytes these are yeah so we're talking here about kind of zeta byte uh, kind of uh, quantum uh, uh, classical supercomputers yeah so that is that is important to to understand so the parallelization is clearly an important an important uh, mechanism yeah we don't know how how many we need to have but you have already supercomputers on the world that have maybe maybe uh, 50,000 up to 100,000 processors in parallel yeah now again uh, if you're looking if if this is your 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 research the parallelization well, move to quantum because even in the in the in the classical computer world, we don't even know how to parallelize software on let's say fifty thousand uh, processors. We don't even know how to do that, yeah, because that depends on on a huge amount of data that you need, yeah, and and, and may, whatever. So, so I will not go into that right now. But that's why uh, even the quantum work has clearly implications, positive implications for the classical computer world. Okay, so this is just a way in order to 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 show. What, uh, what the parallelization should be looking at yeah, is again, uh, how many qubits are we going to, to look at in, in, our, in our circuit? Yeah? And so the, the small size is maybe three to 10. And then you can go up to let's say 50 qubits in, in the medium size. And, uh, and if we look at genomics, we, we kind of made an estimation that we need about 110 qubits for a virus. Remember we're in the COVID period, right? Yeah, so we need maybe up to 110 fully entangled qubits at some point yeah, uh, to, to, to analyze what the status is of the behavior of that kind of virus. Yeah, in any case, these are, these are all things yeah, that are relevant, the uh, data movements, the, the in-memory computing, and, uh, and, and the, the domain analysis. Yeah, how big is the domain that we need to look at to, to find yeah, how to make uh, this, all these quantum programs in a scalable way? Yeah, uh, like how many qubits do we need actually for that? Yeah, so we go we go again one one uh, uh, level lower. Yeah, and uh, that means we we can say something about uh, the the microarchitecture. Now, I, I I was talking always about the, the quantum accelerator. That means you have to have a logic. Yeah, and then you have to go all the way down, such that you have an assembler version and yeah? the C quasm in the compiler, the common quantum assembler. Yeah, that is being sent to the to the to the to the um, the digital uh, microarchitecture of the of the of the your your uh, quantum chip. Yeah, so this blue box yeah, it basically is classical digital. Yeah, and uh, so this is like a, a cache. We know what a cache is. We know a table in which we store the the qubit information. That means the qubit states as well as the amplitudes. Yeah, we have measurements. Uh, that come from, let's say, our simulator, yeah? QB Sima. We'll say something about that later on, also. Yeah, but the simulator is basically an external to the to the quantum microarchitecture, and that is only capable of receiving pure quantum single qubit gates or two qubit gates or three qubit gates. Yeah, Let, let's not make it too simple either. Yeah, one or two or three qubit gates is, that that can be sent to the QB Sim that will do all the operations on the qubit uh, involved. Yeah, and then afterwards we can do a measurement, yeah, of the qubit states in in QB sim, yeah, and update whatever is needed in the symbol table in the microarchitecture, yeah. But, but so we do basically a double storage of qubit information in the yellow box as well as in the blue box, yeah. But why? Because the the evolution of how many qubits we need during the execution of an algorithm is a very variable kind of thing. Yeah? It's, it's not always going higher and higher because sometimes we don't need uh, variables anymore or qubits anymore. And so we, we, we win again uh, space yeah? uh, and memory space usage. So that is something that we, that we still have to investigate much more yeah? with, uh, with computer scientists, with application developers. Yeah? Um, and here you do see, for instance, the routing and the mapping as I, as I explained before. Which is part of the of the microarchitecture. So whenever whenever uh, we have here a particular kind of topology, let's say oh, every point here is a layout of the of the qubits. Yeah, and let's say, let, let's simply assume here I have nine qubits. Yeah, in this in this part. Yeah, so that means that these queues, uh, these queues, for instance, they 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 look at uh, at this particular kind of qubit, and and the second one 
yeah, is, is on this one. So that means there's a, there's a connection, there's a cable, yeah, quantum physically, a cable uh, with uh, for, for this particular kind of instruction, with this physical qubit. Yeah. Now in QBC, we don't have physical connections anymore. Yeah, but that these are all like digital kind of implementations of of the of the quantum chip. Yeah, but there will always be a clear relationship between a Q, yeah, and a particular set, set of of qubits uh, in QB sim. So that is also how we can still do here in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, microarchitecture. We can still do algorithms for routing and mapping the qubits inside inside the the, the QB sim. That means they have to be they will have to be moved so that their proximity is is good enough to have a two qubit gate operation. Again, you can abstract away from that. Yeah, that is not an imposed thing. Yeah, if you don't have anybody or no money to work on it, then you don't you don't look at the routing and the mapping. But if you do, then of course you should you should never close your mind on routing and mapping for for qubits. Yeah, because it will. That is maybe another 20, 30, 40 years away before they, they, the physics people will have solved that. So in the meantime, we still have to do the routing and the mapping to do uh, the, the, the two or three qubit gate operations on, on qubits, okay? So that is important to, to understand. There's, a, there's a, a, an overall clock, of course, yeah? uh, because uh, in, in an hour past uh, when we worked for Intel, yeah, it's basically very clear that there's kind of, here we have a, a bit of flexible time time span, yeah. But the closer we go, let's say to the to the execution. So once it becomes here in 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 the chip back then, yeah, uh, then the time becomes extremely deterministic because if a superconducting says this quantum the C not gate uh, takes let's say twenty nanoseconds, yeah, then it should be twenty. It cannot be nineteen. Cannot be twenty one. It should be twenty. So the timing becomes uh, much more strict, strict and stringent. Yeah, the closer we are to, let's say, the QB sim. Again, this is a thing you, you can impose on QS, QB sim or not impose on QB sim. So in that sense, it's kind of a flexible, flexible kind of tool. So let's, let's, uh, let's talk about QB sim, which again, uh, maybe there, there are people from, from India listening. Well, this was done by another Indian student I had in Delft. Yeah, uh, and he made a, a, an, op an optimized version of our QX simulator that we had, and now we call it QB Sim. Yeah, because of course the company is called QB Sim. So yeah, again we can have a version uh, publicly available. Yeah, uh, but that, that basically means is this is a device, a piece of software that runs on a supercomputer. Yeah, which uh, which uh, needs a lot of memory, but um, but uh, uh, Ravi was very very smart in actually reducing the the memory usage. Of QBC, yeah, and we can still run a lot of things uh, on multiple processors for parallel execution. Remember that we need to parallelize a quantum circuit, and if we have let's say two to the power n fifty, yeah, it's a huge number of paths that we need to uh, execute in parallel. Yeah, so so in in that sense, uh, we need a lot of processors to do all these parallel executions. Yeah, and uh, uh, so that 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 means we need we need to look at this parallel software. Yeah. And then again, if at some point, yeah, we have a good quantum chip, and for me, this is still kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm already eight, nine years now in the field. I haven't seen anything working uh, extremely well. Yeah, so, but if uh, one company really makes a difference, can be a Chinese company or an American company, we don't have European companies working on it right now. Yeah, uh, but if we have a good, good quantum chip, then we can we can always go. Let's say do the C to E C quantum to E quantum kind of cross compilation, yeah. Such that we say, okay, we're gonna try this particular kind of quantum technology, yeah, for for executing the the quantum algorithm, yeah. So that's why this particular uh, picture comes back into 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 play, yeah. Now I will I will go pretty fast, yeah. Uh, let's see, yeah, because you have like five six minutes more. Yeah, I will talk now about, about quantum genomics. Yeah, uh, the, the basics is basically that, uh, and, and I'm talking now about pretty old kind of thing because we, I created a company called Blue B, yeah, not QB, but Blue B, which was bought by one big uh, DNA company in, in the United States uh, um, uh, called Illumina. Yeah, but that was based on what we did there was basically trying to see where this particular short read can be mapped on, on the reference genome. So this is one specific, very small uh, version of, let's say, the, the, the genomics, yeah, human or whatever kind of device uh, 
or, or uh, living living organism we, we're looking at. But here it's basically the, the low humming, uh, humming distance here. So it's the difference between the different cell elements. So it's only one that says, okay, if you put this particular short read yeah, on, on, on position 21, then you only have a humming distance of one. Yeah. So that is, that, is a, that is a very good way in which the sequencing can be done. Yeah. So, so let's, uh, yeah, there are a lot of things that, uh, that, we, that I'm not going to explain right now. Yeah, but let's look at, uh, at the, the example that, uh, that again, uh, my, my, uh, Aritra Sarkar did, because that was based on his, I think it was even his master thesis. Yeah, he already did that kind of, uh, did kind of work. So here you have a reference genome, a very small one for the example. Yeah, and an even smaller short read, so just the two elements. And then you, you need to know where does this particular short read maps into the reference genome, yeah? And of course, you can immediately see it's zero and one. So it should it, it is indeed on this one. So that is kind of what we immediately intuitively see. But what is the algorithm behind? Well, I will give you uh, just in, in a couple of minutes uh, the, uh, or in one minute, maybe the, 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 the different steps. Yeah. Well, you start actually to, to split the reference genome in segments of short reads. Yeah. And the size of the short read is very important because that has been evolving. Yeah, I think we're now at, at 150 length of a short read. Yeah, and here I'm just showing you two. Yeah, but again, that's, that this is, a, this is a, an, an example. Yeah, so that means you 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 store these uh, these three elements. Yeah, these three decompositions into a database, a classical database, and they, they get a particular index. But you see, okay, you have actually uh, four possibilities here, and there is indeed the zero zero is uh, seems to be missing. Yeah, but that that will come back. In a second. Now you see here the dotted line that I that I that I draw here. That shows now we enter the quantum logic. Yeah. So that we we start imposing yeah, certain behavior on these on these qubits. Yeah. Well, actually, these are not qubits on the DNA. Yeah. Uh, uh, like superposition to put them in superposition. So it's that now rather than three combinations, you see here number four popping up. Yeah. So that is that is what you see here in this uh, in this database. So now I have a full database of the reference uh, genomics. Yeah, in our case four. Yeah, and I need to find now where this particular this zero one, where does that match in the in the full database of the genomics part? Yeah, and now you see here a, a color difference, and and the color difference usually means in science there's something else happening. Yeah, because we are not really here showing let's say the genomics part here, but we're showing here the humming distance, how good this particular zero one fits on any of the four elements of, of, of the database. So if I have two yellow parts, that means it's a perfect fit. If I have one gray and one yellow, yeah, or one, one uh, yellow and one gray, we have a partial fit. And if all is yellow, we have no fit at all. Yeah, so that is basically what we try to do in, in computing this humming distance. Yeah, of how well a particular short read fits on the on the reference genome the, or the reference database. So that basically says, well, uh, that we have a perfect fit for the zero zero part eh, for for this one on the zero zero one uh, situation in in the database. That is basically what the, what this figure now now shows. So this is where where this particular short read can be fit uh, into into the 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 the, the fit the, the genomics kind of database yeah that is that is the core the core idea so the different steps are shown here yeah i will not explain these things because that would lead too much because i will i will simply go through yeah these things where the hamming distances are computed yeah and so um, i'm simply highlighting here the fact which i also mentioned in the beginning yeah, new algorithm development also maybe maybe mean that you come up with new gates. Yeah, or maybe not. That depends on, on what is available. So this is, for instance, a, a quantum circuit. Yeah, for the step two. Yeah, where where uh, where you where we're using let's say a new gate here. Yeah, but which does not exist yet. Yeah, so there's a translation step. Yeah, from you see the two Hadamars here. They're they're here too. Yeah, but then you start translating this into into this particular sequence of steps. Yeah, uh, these are the universal gates that we currently have, and this is a this is a universal gate that we would like to have, or we may never have. But with the the translation will always have to be here. So you see here that this these three things are are explained in in this particular way, and the, here again we see here this is the same uh, X gate, so the the not gate. 
Yeah, the, so everything, so this is a translation in those, in those gate sets here. I will not go into the details because that would simply uh, lead, us, lead us too far. Yeah, but this is the way in which, uh, in which uh, for instance, also this, uh, this qubit gates yeah, are translated into these universal gates that we currently have also in our QB sim. Yeah, so that is, uh, that is important to, to understand. And again, you see here that the amplitudes are all uh, 0 0.5. Because remember, in the initial state of your quantum algorithm, they always have all the same kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, amplitudes. Now, at the end of the algorithm, yeah, where the red line is here, yeah, the, the you will have the the amplitudes. Some of them are negative, and and one is much bigger, but positive, but can be the opposite too, right? Yeah, and then if we compute the probability, which is again the the absolute value of the amplitude. Yeah, and then, then then squared. Yeah, so if you do that for all of the amplitudes, these are these become uh, positive. Yeah, so these yellow negative ones they become positive. Yeah, and this one stays positive because it was positive, but anyway, it's it becomes positive, but even bigger positive. So this is the final result. Yeah, for this one run of your algorithm of uh, of the of genomics. Yeah, uh, we're also we will start working, uh, we, the, but that depends on on uh, on QB for instance. Eh? Yeah, we will start working on a genomics uh, microarchitecture. Yeah, uh, you see here there's a D DNA database. Yeah, and then I will I will have to stop. Yeah, because otherwise it would uh, lead lead too far. Yeah, I will not talk about this because I think that's kind of easy. Yeah, now I'm I'm basically concluding. Yeah, so this is uh, this is where everybody in the world is working on quantum computing is basically here. Yeah, and I think we we should be also moving moving here. That is what I already said earlier earlier uh, in, in the in, in, in the talk yeah and then before I give the final slide yeah and the most of the conclusions you already know yeah this is the hype cycle curve from from Gartner Gartner is a, is a very well known uh, IT consulting company in the United States and they they have been looking at a lot of new new technologies and they saw that in the beginning everybody's super enthusiastic putting a lot of money into it including quantum. And then they will reach uh, some kind of top where there's no clear uh, commercial kind of value anymore. A lot of people, companies, organizations, they step out of it. And I think it's for, for uh, uh, universities and research organizations to not uh, go that, to, to that, uh, that particular hype curve, but to simply say, okay, this is the goal we want to achieve in the long term and then have a, have a research plan themselves. Yeah? So that I think is important also as a notion yeah, to understand what uh, what that is, so I can be very fast on on the final conclusion. Yeah, uh, the the goal should be much more on quantum accelerators. Yeah, the eighty twenty rule: eighty percent of the time is done on twenty percent of the code. That may hold also true for quantum. Yeah, um, so we 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 need to look look at multiple layers. Yeah, up to the simulator. Yeah, we I think it's extremely important that we start having international collaboration on these things. Yeah, be it, uh, yeah, I had students from, from, let's say, from India, China, uh, all over Europe in Delft, yeah, and I, and I, I will have hopefully the same, the same uh, once, once I stay in, in Portugal, yeah, inside QB, I will, I have a lady from, uh, from Iran, uh, Jasmine Samadi, uh, so who will be joining me hopefully in a couple of weeks, yeah, she will be working on microarchitecture, so international collaboration, extremely valuable, yeah, and, uh, and we can still use quantum, qu classical computers too, so, that is basically the entire story that I wanted to bring. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bertels. Um, we have a couple of, uh, of questions here from the, from the chat. Uh, there has been also some reactions to those questions, but I'll try to at least frame them in a way that uh, uh, it can be productive for everybody. So the first question that came in, um, uh, was about uh, um, Grover's algorithm. And the specific question is, can it be made deterministic? And there was also an, an answer uh, about um, that, uh, in fact, there's no stochastic part in it. So if the oracle is decomposed, it is deterministic. I don't know if uh, you, what's your comment on this, on the deterministic aspect of Grover's uh, algorithm. Yeah, um, Grover is indeed used in, in, in many encryption and decryption kind of algorithms. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, is, that is true. But any quantum algorithm, uh, whenever, whenever you start combining a large number of qubits yeah, in superposition or fully entangled, there's a right. difference that would lead us too far. 
you, you always have a, 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 a wide number of parallel executions of the same algorithm on the same number of qubits. Yeah, and it's kind of a random, it's not a random walk, but you the, the measurements that you do on, on, on the result, yeah, it's never that one run will always give you the same kind of result because you will always have, let's say, let's say two qubits, and sometimes you take this qubit, but the other run, you take the other qubit. Yeah. And so that, that is how it's difficult to predict in advance mm -hmm. that one result will always give you the same result. Uh, one, one run will always give you the same result. So in that sense, the, 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 the non-deterministic kind of nature of quantum still holds. Okay. All right. I have another question that is more specific to the work in the QBSIM simulator, uh, which is, uh, um, is, is QBSIM a universal simulator? Um, and so, and also as, uh, um, uh, another question is how many qubits uh, and non-Clifford gates uh, can it simulate? I mean, is this something that you have a handle on this? Well, that depends. Again, uh, I, I made that uh, I, uh, maybe it was not clear enough, but I will I will show this slide again. Yeah, that depends on, on how much memory we have on the computer. Yeah, because the the QB sim, yeah, is actually made uh, for for relatively uh, actually it doesn't doesn't mind uh, to have let's say two hundred qubits, but if they're fully entangled. Yeah, or if put in superposition, you need you need this amount these amounts of, of memory. This is only for fifty qubits. You already see that this is zeta bytes kind of uh, memory that you right. need for, for memory. So that that's so it's not QBC which has limit. It's a classical computer which has a limit a limitation in memory. So so I had another question about your microarchitecture. It, uh, well, it has this clock, it has this uh, organization that suggests there's the sequential execution. Um, so uh, are you basically saying that one could decompose, uh, let's say a larger um, uh, quantum problem into a sequence of subproblems and in a way compose them, maybe not sequential, but exploring uh, um, um, parallel or exploring a concurrent composition of the solutions to arrive at a solution to the to the bigger problem. I don't know if this is, uh, I mean, I look at this picture and it seems a lot of that, that you, you've done a, a, a sequential composition of subproblems. Um, well, again, th this is, this is a, a schema that, uh, that we used for, let's say, years ago for, let's say, the up to 15 superconducting qubits, physical mm -hmm. qubits. Yeah, but now I want to look at, at, at perfect qubits and at a higher scale. So I, I do, I, I need to be capable of, of storing intermediate results or final results, but mostly it's intermediate results because you will see that the, that the number of qubits that you need will grow uh, during, during the execution, then it will, it will shrink again and grow again, shrink again. So that's kind of variable. So you need to be able to store the intermediate results you can keep them in, into, into the QB sim. That is true. You can keep them here. Uh, wait, where, where, where's my mouse? I'm looking for my mouse. Yeah. Uh, you, can, you can start in QB sim. Yeah. But, but of course, at some point, you, you, maybe you, want, you need to release the QB sim because that depends on how big your, your machine is. Yeah. And you want to store maybe partial intermediate results into the microarchitecture in, the, right. in your own main memory and then put them back into QB that, that, because that is still like a bit unknown. That is still, that's a good question, but, but I cannot really give a specific answer to that. Okay. Uh, all right. I mean, I'm uh, wondering if there's any other questions. We had another question uh, going on here in, in the chat, but there's been uh, a few answers and also some discussion uh, about uh, uh, Q logic operators and how different they are from classical uh, logic operators and there's uh, an answer about it, their reversibility. So I'll, I think I'll table that uh, question for now. And I'm wondering if there's any other questions going well, on. I, I, but yeah. Because I didn't mention that, in, but that is indeed a, a very big difference between classical computing and quantum right. is the reversibility. You can always go from left to right classically, but from right, right to left is impossible. Yeah, in quantum, yes, there is. You can so the, the time is actually bidirectional; it goes goes forward mm -hmm. and backward. So it is. It is nevertheless an important problem. But but again, the 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 it's a multidimensional world. Yeah, the mathematics behind is completely different, and and so you it, it's very difficult to to visualize that. But but you know, uh, you you simply need to represent a lot of amplitudes 
to represent the qubit states that with which you're, you're working right now. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, I would uh, wrap it up by now. Well, thank you again, uh, Professor Bertels, for your, your presentation and your time. And uh, um, so thank you very much. I would like to take also this opportunity to introduce next week uh, presentation by Federico Sepaldiere from the University of Southern California, who is also going to be um, uh, making or uh, offering a, an overview of quantum computing and quantum annealing. So he's going to talk about a couple of example applications on how he uh, has mapped successfully this to, uh, in particular, the D-wave uh, supercomputing. So that's going to be uh, next week. Um, so I don't know if there's any other uh, issues, uh, questions people want to bring up at this point. If not, uh, let's wrap it up. Thank you once again, uh, Kuhn, for this presentation, and I hope to see you all uh, next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. People still have questions. You can still mail me eh? um, to to. Have a couple of questions there, Kun. Um... Yeah, just just okay. go. the QB email is is the easiest for me to read. So Kumbertels at QB .eu is the one I read. So if you have questions, just send me an email, uh, and then uh, then I will try to reply to it. We are still streaming on YouTube. So. Oh, okay.